new Bibles, if you can reach forward and get them. Uh, page 810 in your Bibles, in the Pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. We are, uh, we're starting a new series called Fulfilled, and it's really a continuation in the Sermon on the Mount. And what we'll see in our text this morning is that Jesus fulfills the law, but he doesn't abolish it. And so what we'll see is uh, his teaching about that today, but then even if you look forward as far as the headings in your Bibles too, what you see is, is Jesus says, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this. And what Jesus is, is telling us is that our lives as Christians, uh, we have the opportunity to fulfill what Jesus has done, to have it fulfilled in our lives. And really when we do that, it's not something that we do out of compulsion or fear or guilt, but instead we do that in order to live a fulfilled life in Jesus Christ. To say, hey, this is what God's law is for me, and this is how I can have the most fulfilled life, is by doing what Jesus has done and called me to do as well. Uh, to this point, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, and um, we've found that in the Beatitudes, there's ways that Jesus talks about getting into the kingdom, right? And we saw the first four Beatitudes are about getting into the kingdom. You have to be poor in spirit. You have to mourn over your sin. You have to be meek. You have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then Jesus describes life in the kingdom, that once you've entered the gates of the kingdom, once you're living in that kingdom for Jesus Christ, your life is marked by being merciful and pure in heart, by being a peacemaker and being persecuted. Because of scheduling changes, we're going to skip over the next section, which if you have your Bibles open, it's salt and light. And Pastor Jim Martin's going to preach on that about a month from now. And so what we'll do is, is get into this next series where Jesus Christ talks about fulfilling the law. That's what our text is today. So Matthew 5, beginning at verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Entering the kingdom, life in the kingdom, being salt and light in the kingdom. Jesus is laying out a way of life, laying out what it looks like to be a follower of his, to be part of what God's rule in heaven is doing here on earth. And what's been very strong to this point are descriptions of this life in Christ, the adjectives of what it looks like to follow Jesus. But that's not how teaching was done at that time. And so the religious leaders had to wonder about the law. Okay, Jesus, this is really great that you've described all these things, the kind of life that people would live. It's, it's great that you've said in broad terms what it's going to look like to be a follower, but Jesus, let's get down to the brass tacks, the specifics, the details. Let's get down to the law. And what it ultimately boils down to is this. Jesus, we've been taught about the importance of the law. We've grown to love the law. Our parents grew up with the law. Their parents and their parents and their parents. As far back as anyone can remember, we've been taught this is how you're supposed to live. These are the laws you're supposed to keep. This is what you're supposed to do. But Jesus, you haven't said a single word about keeping those laws. You've talked about being merciful and a peacemaker and persecuted and pure in heart and all these kinds of things. But Jesus, you haven't been specific. You've said all this, but what about all that? You've given us something new, but what about all the stuff that we've known and loved for so long? What we find is that Jesus shows that the Bible is God's word. Jesus shows that the Bible is God's word. Look again at verse 18. Jesus says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, 
will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Jesus talks about the law and the prophets in our text today. And what he's saying when he says law and prophets is as he's talking about the whole Old Testament. This is a way that the Jewish people spoke about what we know today as the Old Testament. And and at the time that Jesus is speaking, this is the whole of God's word, right? This is all that God's word was at the time. Since then, we've we've been able to, to expand God's word and be able to say the New Testament is what it is. And church councils have brought this together over years. And we've recognized that all scripture is God breathed. But but what Jesus is saying is that the Bible is true. It's so true that even to the smallest detail, it's true. An iota is the smallest Greek letter. It's the letter I in Greek, but it looks just like our I. It's just a a small line, an iota. He says every iota is important. Even the littlest dot won't pass away until it's accomplished. A dot was used in the Hebrew writings to distinguish between different letters. And what Jesus says is is that little tiny detail, the littlest mark on the paper as far as God's word goes, even the tiniest letters are true. But it's, it's not just that God's word is true, it's that it's being accomplished. We could look at our our worship bulletin and say, this is true, this is accurate, this describes how things are, right? We could say that this is factually correct, and we could say it's true, but we could even look at this morning's bulletin and say, you know, there were certain things that that weren't listed in there, there were certain things that that were accomplished, and and maybe we'll tweak a song, or maybe we'll change a little bit of the order, and and it might not be accomplished, right? It, It can be factually correct, But it's a totally different thing to say, this will be accomplished. But that's what Jesus says about God's word. Until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. What this means is every prophecy will come true. Every promise will be fulfilled. All the warnings that God gives will be followed through on what Martin Luther said as well. Listen to this quote. A man's word is a little sound that flies into the air and soon vanishes. But the word of God is greater than heaven and earth, yea, greater than death and hell, for it forms part of the power of God and endures everlastingly. That's what Jesus says here. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not. What powerful truth. What, what Jesus is saying is this is God's word. And what's most amazing about Jesus is he didn't just say, this is my doctrine of scripture, this is my theology of scripture, this is my understanding of infallibility or inspiration or anything like that, but Jesus actually had the integrity to put what he believed about scripture into practice. So you think about Jesus, as soon as his, his public ministry starts, we hear that he's, he's sent out to the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil. And, and in three ways, the devil tries to, to trick Jesus and tries to tempt him and tries to get him into trouble. And in each of those times, you know what Jesus does? Quotes scripture. He goes back to God's word. And he says, probably most famously as far as our our knowledge of of that story. He says, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have to live by God's word. Even in times of temptation, Jesus shows us that he lived by God's word. When he was trapped by some of the teachers and they try to get him and try to get him into trouble and by trapping him, Jesus, well, what does your scripture say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He goes back to God's word even when he's being trapped. Do you think when Jesus is having his life wrung out, when he's being torn to pieces and he's dying on the cross, and and some have said that that when we're most vulnerable, when we're in those times, we don't have the opportunity to to think through what's going to come out of our mouths. We don't have the opportunity to, to take deep breaths and figure it out, but instead Jesus instinctively goes to Scripture, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even in his darkest day, he goes to what Scripture says. Jesus' life was centered around it. We learn from other scripture 
that he alone is the one who kept God's law perfectly. Hebrews 4.15 describes Jesus and says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Right? Jesus perfectly kept the law. He did everything that we couldn't do. And also in his other teachings, in Matthew 19, Jesus says, The Creator says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and two will become one flesh. Well, if you look at Genesis 2, the Creator, God, didn't say, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, but, but Moses wrote that. And what Jesus is saying is, even though Moses authored this, God is the ultimate author of Scripture. Right? Even though Moses is the person through whom God worked, God is the ultimate author of this. God said these words. Or you think about Peter in, the, in Pentecost in Acts 4. He quotes Psalm 2. He says, You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. He quotes Psalm 2. Even though David wrote it, the Holy Spirit inspired him and helped him have these words to say. So it's God who said it. It's God's word. It's a high view of Scripture. If Scripture says it, then God says it. Every iota, every dot will be accomplished. Jesus is saying here that Scripture is completely divine. It's completely without error. It's internally consistent. It has tremendous power that it's sufficient by the power of God to get anything done. And as Christians, we know that, that Scripture is the primary way to get to know who God is, to see what He's done for us, to get to understand how He's working constantly for us and how ultimately to love Him and live for Him. What we also find in today's text is that Jesus shows that the Bible is all about Him. Look at verse 17. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law and the prophets, the Bible, is so authoritative that even the tiniest detail is going to happen. And Jesus says, I didn't come to, to wipe those out or destroy those things, but I came to fulfill those things. It means that the whole Bible is about Jesus. You know, our youngest son is named Emmaus because Lisa and I love the story of the two travelers on the road to Emmaus. There are these two men who are walking along after Jesus has died and, and there's rumors about him rising from the dead and these two men are walking along on the road to Emmaus and this stranger comes up. He says, what are you guys talking about? And, oh, we're talking about Jesus, haven't you heard? And so they start talking about him and, and unbeknownst to them, Jesus is that stranger. He's walking with them. And, 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 and Luke says that, that Jesus explained to them how everything in Scripture, all the law and the prophets, were about him. And they recognize that and they see, wow, this, this is Christ fulfilling all these things in God's word. So that when God promised to Eve that her child would one day crush the head of the serpent, he's talking about Jesus. When God evicts the people from the garden because of their sin and says, you're not allowed back in my presence because of your sin, it's Jesus who welcomes us back into the presence of God for eternity. When, when God makes promises to Abraham and says, your children will bless all the nations of the world, it's about Jesus, right? He is the one who's the light of the United States. No, he's the light of the world, right? How many of you guys watched Friday night, the opening ceremonies? Some of you did. Good. Whenever I see those opening ceremonies and I see all these people with, with different cultures and backgrounds and histories and clothing and flags and different things that represent who they are, my heart swells because it makes me think, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if one day when we're in glory, God's going to say, look at the diversity of my people, that, that every knee and every tongue, every knee shall bow and tongue confess, that, that all people from all the nations of the world are gathered up as my people. And it just makes me think, well, there'll be like some sort of parade, some sort of opening ceremony for eternity to say, look at all that God has brought in to his kingdom and to his people. But God is talking about Jesus when he says, you will bless all the people of the world. 
Jesus is the ultimate at what's hinted in Joseph's story. When Joseph says to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. We see perfectly that in Jesus Christ, what Satan intends for evil, the death of God's son. Ha! I won. No. This is God intending it for good, giving us redemption. He's the exodus from the bondage of slavery. He clears away every obstacle in our lives, just like the Red Sea was split open. He's the one who's lifted up that we might believe in him and be saved. He is the perfect Israel. He's the promised son. He's the Messiah longed, hoped for. He's the temple who's destroyed and rebuilt again. This is about Jesus. Sometimes we make things complicated and we say, well, there's all these stories and there's all this doctrine and there's all this stuff in God's word and some of it's confusing and I don't understand why, why is there's so much warfare and there's so many ugly things that happen in Scripture. Let's keep it simple. Scripture is about Jesus. Right? It's about God revealing himself, saying all of this points to Jesus, and every page of God's word is a signpost to Jesus that he is coming, and this is about him. He didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to destroy all that the religious leaders had known and loved. He's what all those things are about. He's the pinnacle of those things. And because of that, we have perfect righteousness through Jesus. But Jesus, what about the law? We have descriptions, we have adjectives. We don't have a lot of prescriptions. We don't have a lot of law. Jesus speaks clearly on that in verse 20. Look at verse 20. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Scribes and Pharisees were the holiest of all holy people in that day. And Jesus says, unless you're even holier than them, you can't get into the kingdom. Jesus, I thought you just said that we had to be born again to get into the kingdom. Jesus, I thought you said that we have to just be poor in spirit to get into the kingdom and that we have to mourn over our sin and we have to be meek and we have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus, are you changing your story right now? Does this mean, Jesus, that when I look at my own life and what I've done, even as a pastor, does this mean that when I look at my life that, that I can't get in? Does this mean that, that I can't do it? Does this mean that I'll never be righteous enough to enter the kingdom? I have to surpass the holiest of holy people. Yes, it does. All those things are true on your own means if you're depending on your own life and what you've done on your own you're never going to make it if you're depending on what you've done and saying i want to be good enough on my own you never will if i want to say be righteous enough to be part of the kingdom on my own, you never will. Even the best of us here never will. See, the motto, the slogan, the attitude of these leaders had been this. Look at all that I've done. Look at my generosity. Look at my understanding of the law. Look at the ways that I keep all 612 of these laws, that I have one for every day of the year and one for every body part of, of humanity. Look at all that I've done in my righteousness. But Jesus comes along with a new gospel message, and he says this. Look at what I've done. I've kept your law perfectly. I've never had a thought or word or deed that's evil or wicked or even stained by sin. What Jesus does is reaches out his arms, not as the Pharisees do to bring attention to themselves, but he reaches out his arms on the cross and says, look at what I've done for you. The gospel is clear that Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God, that even though we're unrighteous, when we believe in him and trust in him, we can have that righteousness for ourselves. And that righteousness, guess what? Exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. 
That's how we get in the kingdom of God, by Christ alone. Don't look at pretty good keeping of the law. Look at perfect keeping of the law. Don't look at pretty good generosity. Look at perfect generosity. Don't look at pretty good faithfulness. Look at perfect faithfulness. Don't look at pretty good handling of temptation. Look at perfect handling of temptation. And I know it's tempting for us at this point to say, oh, cool. I'm completely off the hook. I get to do whatever I want the rest of my life. I can sin and sin boldly because, you know what? It's Jesus' righteousness. It doesn't matter what I do. He's won the battle, so it doesn't matter at all what I do. I can just live completely liberally, completely free because it's all what Jesus has done and nothing what I've done. Jesus addresses that in our text today. Look at verse 19. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom. I think what really changes is our attitude for why we do good, for why we study God's word, for why we want to live in in an appropriate way. What happens is, instead of saying out of fear, out of wonder about my status for eternity, I better be good and earn enough, and put enough grace in my tank that that I can say, look at all I've done, Jesus. Instead of having that kind of attitude like the Pharisees had, what we're to do is say, Jesus Christ has done it all for me, and I can't help but live for him now. I want to be someone who is pure in heart. I want to be someone who's a peacemaker. I want to be someone who is is persecuted for the sake of righteousness because I'm willing to say, you know what? I want to live for God's word because God's word has given me life, right? This is the greatest life preserver there ever has been existed. This is the thing that rescues us and gives us hope and gives us life, not just for this life, but for eternity. And for us then to say, oh, forget it, it doesn't matter, would be the most foolish thing. I would think even if we had that attitude, we probably wouldn't understand what God's done for us in Jesus Christ. But when we do, we say, God, I want your word to be infused in my life. I want your word to be so part of me that people see your word shining through. I want to live like Jesus did, where in different points of his life, he always goes back to God's word and always has that on the tip of his tongue, ready to go whenever life happens. Tim Keller says that as Christians, we not only search God's word, but we let it search us. We say, God, I want your word to have authority in my life. I want your word to change me and transform me and make me more and more into the image of your son. It's what Luke publicly professed to today, to do everything in his power by the Holy Spirit with the help of the community to live for Christ Jesus. It's what all of us who've made that commitment in our lives are committed to as well, and it's what Jesus calls us to do today. Not just to see God's word as something, of, oh, this is good doctrine or this is really helpful for me in a time of crisis, but to say, God, I want to be transformed and shaped by your word. And so even though we have the righteousness of Christ, even though he's done everything for us, it doesn't mean we throw away God's word. It doesn't mean we throw away his teaching, but instead we're still called to hear and do the word of God. what Christ's call is on us this morning. And it's why, again, as leaders, we're excited about this translation because we think it's the most faithful way to apply God's word to our lives. It's a little bit different. You may have noticed if you had the NIV with you today, there's a few different words that are, are changed. But, but to say, God, I, I want to know your word down to the, to the smallest dot, down to the smallest letter, so I can understand it and apply it. And God, I want to hear it fresh. I want it to be so part of me that my life is transformed by it. Let's pray that that would be the case. Our Heavenly Father, your work for us in Jesus Christ is something that that makes us new, something that transforms us, something that, that makes us say, God, your word is life. God, your word speaks to me. God, your word molds me and shapes me and makes me who you want me to be.
God, help us not to just hear the word and, and walk away from it and forget it like someone who looks in the mirror and forgets what they look like. But instead, Lord, help us to be changed by your word. Help us to remember what it says, to remember what you've done for us so that we can live for you by your word, by your spirit. God, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.